All right. People are starting to trickle in. Fellow Sydneys, welcome to the Sydney convention. I don't know what's happened here, but everyone is a uh, is under our demand gen manager's name, Sydney, right now. If you want to rename, feel free. If you want to be Sydney for the next hour, feel free to do that too. Um, I'm Adam McQueen. I am the host today. And let me just, I don't know how the heck that happened. <laughs> Sid, identity theft is not a joke. All right, folks, as you are joining, do you want to just hit up the chat? Let me know where you're located, what your company does, and what you're looking to get out of the session today. I'm, I'm tuning in from Vancouver. I'm actually in my new apartment. So this side, like right now, my apartment, the way it's up, looks kind of semi-normal professional. If you panned over to this side, it's like complete anarchy with like everything my dog's chewed up and half-eaten boxes. So we, we've kept it kind of professional on this side. But we got high <laughs> Sydney's. Nice to see you, Cheered. Glad you made it. Cheered. Sales enablement and message bird. We got Sarah from Boston. Indianapolis. Hi, Oh, snow snowy dallas does it snow in dallas i didn't think that was a was that a thing uh, they're get they're getting pretty cold right now i got a cold hey. snap coming through see i'm 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 ignorant with this with this stuff yeah we got we got people from across the oh birmingham england i appreciate mark i appreciate you coming from england what time would it be that seven hours ahead i appreciate you i hope this is going to be a good way to kind of enjoy your evening yo who's in tofino Oh, is that? That's Adi. That's on our team. Tofino? Now I'm, now I'm getting jealous. All right, folks. So I'm going to do a little intro for, for everyone that is new to this. I'll give a little lay of the land, what we're going to do here, and then we'll dive right in. So first things first, This, is, if you're comfortable with your camera on, sweet. Let's, let's do it. I love being able to just kind of talk with people, engage with people during the sessions. There's nothing worse than doing a webinar in front of like 200, 300 faces names. Like I want to see everyone's faces. If, if you're not comfortable, that's fine too. But I'd love if you did. Two, fire away in the chat. This is a live AMA. So if you've got questions as we're chatting, drop them in there as we go. Feel free. You've got a point. You disagree with what we're saying. You agree with what we're saying. I want to hear everything in there. Only thing in the chat, don't drop any Wordle spoilers. I have not done today's yet. And that's my lunchtime activity. Yeah, I know. Super exciting. Um, my partner in crime, Ben, who is lurking in the background, he'll be monitoring the questions in there. And he'll mess. if you've got a question you want to ask us, he'll drop you a note and see if you want to jump on camera and talk, ask us it in person. Love, love if you did. If not, that's good too. I can just read the questions out as well as we go. And last thing, housekeeping. I feel like I'm obligated to say this during a webinar, but yes, session will be recorded. Yes, we will send it to you. And yes, it's also going to be on our podcast feed as of tomorrow morning, knock on wood. Okay. Introducing who you actually came here for. I am joined by Mitch Comstock the product marketing manager at Lead IQ. Uh, Mitch is in charge of the competitive program over at Lead IQ and the sales enablement side of things, which is probably a pretty common, uh, something that a lot of people in the audience can relate to. Mitch is also an avid board game fan. Mitch, what's, what's the go-to board game? Oh, uh, we just got Wingspan, which won, I think, game of the year last year. So would highly recommend if anybody's looking for a little bit a more challenging one. Okay. Okay. I like it. And our second guest, none other than Clue's own account executive, Kayam Narani. Kayam, one of the best competitive sellers, one of the best guys I know. I was actually thinking about this. I was so excited to have Q on one of these sessions and I was thinking about it. Like we're, we're, we're going to be talking all about competitive and competitive selling. And I was thinking about like, there's probably our competitors probably have like a picture of Kayam on a dartboard or something like, you know, in like the baddies in like old Batman's have like Batman's face and they're throwing dartboards. Like this is a compliment cue, but that's just how damn good he is as a seller and a competitive seller. 
Q, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. And as Chelsea mentioned, if you'd like to change your name again from Sydney, you can rename if you click on your on the three dots. If you want to be Sydney, that's cool with me too. Megan, Megan, aka wannabe Sydney. I appreciate it. Or wannabe Cindy. I won't call you out for the typo, but I just did. All right. Enough of this chit chat. Let's get into what we came here for. For this session, we're talking about closing the deal. How do product marketers and sellers, how can they partner to knock out competitors? And I want to just dive straight into this. Q, as a seller, competitive insights, they're not just a one size fits all answer. So how does Intel need to be presented to you for you to actually use it? Let's be frank. There we go. Dollar in the mute jar. Um, <laughs> no, at the highest level, honestly, I think what helps me the most as a seller is actually having talk tracks, like, like consistent, concise talk tracks that I can regurgitate on a call or quickly adapt on a call if I, if I want to change things around. But what I don't find helpful is getting information that's raw. Sometimes I'll come across an article about my competitor's new chief product officer or something like that. And as a seller, to be honest, I don't really know what to do with this, right? And if I go and create my own narrative for it, it's really going to scare the marketing team and it's going to create inconcise messaging. And when you have these large sales teams that are growing over time, you're going to have sellers that are talking about different things. Um, and that's really not good, right? And it's really hard to bring that all together. So having consistent um, regurgitatable talk tracks that I can just quickly and easily access on the fly, only a couple clicks away because when I need these, I need them quickly. Otherwise, my product marketing manager is going to get a message three minutes before my conversation going, hey, I need information on this. So um, yeah concise, consistent messaging, short, easy to digest, a couple clicks away. Um, that's how I prefer it. Mitch, your, your take on this is the product marketer. Yeah. I mean, I think any product marketers run into the situation where you build a awesome battle card or some kind of piece of content, and then you see it's not actually getting used. Um, we talk a lot in product marketing about focusing benefits versus features. And I think what Q touched on there as a seller, you want to be conversational and you want to keep it at a high level of what makes you different, what makes you better than competitor X, or um, even just in general, what are your, your big uh, differentiators? So um, I think the other point Q brought up on making stuff accessible. I mean, that's the biggest thing from, sa from sales. Um, they're busy. They're going to tell you they're busy and that's why they're not using your content. So finding a way to get that to them that's either in their workflow or one or two clicks away, they can scan it really quick and they know what to say. Um, I think that's kind of the, the biggest thing to get that usage. Um, yeah. Q, we've talked a little bit too, like off air, we were talking about as well, making it accessible to you kind of on this note, but making it accessible as an A, there's like different, you kind of talked to me about these different stages of the deal and what you need during these different stages. Do you want to, do you want to share with that? Cause that was, I was taking notes as you were talking and I'd love for everyone else to kind of hear this bit. Yeah, this is a really interesting thing to talk about because I was actually an SDR for two years and then I transitioned into an AE role and I got to kind of experience this organic evolution to how I talked about competitors and what I used at different stages in the deal. And obviously as an SDR, you're very early in the cycle, right? And if you're getting questions about competitors at all, you want to not dive into details about them. You want to brush them off. You want to leave that to the AE to go into there and sell the way they want to sell based on how they handle the deal. But um, as an SDR, right, when you're staying high level, for me, the biggest thing was quick dismiss points. I probably never ever went any deeper than quick dismiss points, right? So what's the highest level differentiator that you can use to simply just brush your competitor off and make your prospect feel like they're in the right place. Um, and you know there are strengths and value that you're gonna be able to provide your prospect that they care about that your competitors may not be strong at. Right. And again, staying really high level with that stuff is all you really need to do as an AE two, I try to stay towards quick dismiss points, high level value focused talk tracks, because anytime I get into a situation where we're in like a feature comparison battle, I feel like I'm losing the deal. Right. I don't have control over that. I don't know exactly what's resonating with the prospects. I don't know what's important to them. I don't know how they're perceiving each feature and how how much value they see from each thing. And there's too much things to stay on top of there. So if I can keep them focused on high level messaging, these are the key things that I think you find the most important that we do really well and that our competitors are not as great at um, is really where I want to focus on. And then 
Of course, you're going to get really deep into the cycle where you need to have strong information on pricing and product features to be able to address questions. But I try to keep feature level differentiation points for addressing questions, not proactive differentiation. I'm never going to message my prospects and say, hey, this is why our feature is better than theirs. This is exactly what our feature does over theirs. I will use that stuff to answer questions that my prospects ask me about specific things that are important to them in the moment. But outside of that, I'm staying high level. I'm focused on high level value um, and things that prospects will remember and can grab onto and that I can stay consistent with throughout the entire deal. Mitch, what about from the product marketing side, like uh, Q said, these kind of like different stages of the deal. Is that sort of how you structure your, your kind of competitive content and what, what are you providing sellers with uh, at these kind of different stages? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's similar for what I think about and kind of what our team does. Um, you want to stay with the SDRs, especially it's quick dismiss. Um, usually an SDR is going to get the question, Hey, we have competitor X, like what makes you guys different? And that's probably all the information they really need to get. Right. They're, they're never going to get asked like, Hey, what does your feature do? Um, and then I think as you work with your AEs, one of the things I think about as a product marketer is we have to almost be, I, I, and Q can talk to this, but I know sellers are trained to do that discovery call. And sometimes what a uh, customer or a prospect asks for really isn't like, if they ask you for a product, you have to find out, Hey, what's the root challenge here? What's the, what are you trying to solve? Um, product marketing has to do the same thing with our sales teams to understand because a lot of times you're going to get requests of, Hey, I need a one pager for this, or, Hey, they're asking about this feature. And getting some of the context of what's the deal, what stage are we in, what are they really asking? I think you can really sparse out and get to the root of that instead of just taking kind of orders and creating 15 different one pagers that get used once and then never again, right? Um, but yeah, I think it all comes down to kind of talking with your sales team and kind of opening those lines of communication with them um, so that you can kind of hear from them exactly what they need because they'll know best. Um, and then you kind of work from there. One other thing that I wanted to add to that I was just thinking about is, and I, I wanted to share this because I feel like it's often overlooked, but one thing that I think is crucial to provide to SDRs specifically from a competitive standpoint are giving them questions to ask that help them identify if there are any competitors even in the deal. Because a lot of times AEs are walking into deals and they don't even know if a competitor is in the deal or not. And if I know that a competitor is in the deal from an SDR, I'm thinking about you know, already thinking about ways that I can deposition that competitor. I'm already trying to figure out based on previous conversations or notes in our CRM, what I might be able to use to deposition our competitors, what might be important to those prospective clients. It just helps you get ahead of it. And if you don't, then you're blindsided on a call, right? And it's so much harder to prepare those talk tracks and bring that stuff up on the fly. So um, questions to ask that help your SDRs identify if there are competitors and deals, what terms or verbiage to listen for that help you um, understand if there is a competitor in the deal are really helpful things to, um, to provide to SDRs. Mm -hmm. Well, and some, and sometimes you don't even have to be tricky about it. You can just ask them, Hey, are you evaluating anyone else? hundred percent. Yeah. Another, another thing that I teach our sales team, when you do hear that, that there's competitor in the deal, it's important to understand how much they know about that competitor. Cause it could be they're using them today. It could be they're actively evaluating them. It could be they just went and Googled who your competitors are and they want to see what your reaction is. Um, and finding out what that level of detail can tell you, am I going to be able to just knock them out of the deal right here? Or do I need to start preparing for some deeper um, comparison between the two of us? A hundred percent. Q, I think this one's kind of geared towards yourself around. I think it's, we can ask this in regards to kind of the discovery call. One of the mm -hmm. questions that we just asked in here was um, what sort of the ratio do you think about a ratio in, in terms of talking to listening when you're doing sort of discovery on that, on that side of the coin? I want to talk as little as possible, to be honest. I try to keep my discovery as simple as possible. Um, to be honest, in my discovery, I honestly only ask three questions and I go back to these three questions in different ways because prospects will often not answer your question fully, or they might answer a different question when you ask them one, but it's always trying to understand what their goal is, what their challenges are and why they're doing this now. That's all I care about because the SDR will already understood their process. I'll have their tech stack from there and all the other little nuts and bolts of process. I can tease out through those high level discovery questions 
on goals, challenges, and why now? And those are really sit, uh, simple, quick questions that you can ask, and then you can just shut up and let your prospect, prospect talk. And then dig into that stuff, right? Elaborate, um, you know, ask what else? What else can you share? What else is important to you? Um, just kind of tease out as much as possible, but 100%, if I can keep my talk ratio um, as little as possible, especially in the discovery section, it's really important because I'm going to end up doing a lot of talking throughout the demo as well. Mm -hmm. So to keep my prospect really engaged and feel like they're getting their voice heard and really understanding their business needs, I want to shut up as much as possible during that discovery portion. I love that. You let them fill in the blanks too. Yeah. So one thing I learned over the last year too, is like not to be afraid of silence. Um, prospects will stop talking. And if you um, don't fill that gap, there's like this weird tension and somebody has to fill that tension, right? It's like human nature. And if you're ahead of that and you know that they're going to fill that tension, you can just sit there and be quiet and let them say something or mention something. They're going to prompt conversation, whether it's asking you to keep going with your presentation, whether it's adding something, whether it's asking you a question, but silence is, is really helpful. That's, that's such a good point. I mean, for me, on a content side interviewing, that's literally what like rule 101 is to do that and allow the, the people to experiment because then they start to, un you start, they uncover more things than if you just keep cutting them off and like setting that expectation that you're leading the conversation that you're talking. And it's not about you, it's about them. Um, this is a question that I got before the session. Uh, I'll ask, this is towards the seller, but actually I'd like to get Mitch's take too, but Q, if you could only have one, what would that one piece of consent competitive insight you you'd want heading into a deal? If it was like one slide of information that I could have walking into a deal against a given competitor, what I would want is somewhere between ideally seven to 10 high level differentiator points, value focused, high level differentiator points that I could pick and choose from after understanding my prospects needs to drive a value wedge. So we'll, well, I'm sure we'll talk about the concept of a value wedge further in this conversation, but I wanna focus all my selling around a value wedge. The first thing I'm trying to do if I'm in a competitive conversation is understand what's the value wedge, try and figure out two to three things that are important to the prospects that are unique to our solution and not unique to our competitors. And then drive those home in every conversation that I have with every prospect in that company over and over and over again, consistently and that stuff will stick with them and it will drive the deal forward. It keeps them away from feature focused conversations. And if I'm going to have one piece of competitive insight, there's no side, there's no one size fits all to be honest, right? There is absolutely no one size fits all for competitive. That's why a lot of times the stuff that you provide to your sellers, they're going to adapt in some way, shape or form based on the prospective client, based on the way they sell. So um, keeping that stuff, high level in general and giving me the ability to pick and choose what's important to me in that context and then adapt that and use that is what I would prefer. Mitch, your take. Yeah, I think, I think like you said, it's hard to limit it down to one, but I think the most basic thing to understand about your competitors is what makes us different. And I think one A or one B to that is what makes them different? Why do prospects pick them? And I think that has kind of a, a two things that helps is you can actually talk to that in your deal to say, hey, these guys are great for this use case, but we've seen customers make the switch to us for X, Y, Z. Um, but I think it also helps sellers identify early when a deal, like what deals are worth kind of staying on top of and which you might not win because just the competitors are better fit. Like you got to realize that your competitors, there's a reason they're, you're competing against them. They do things well. And if your sellers can understand what they do well, it'll save them time chasing deals that you really don't have much of a shot of closing because you're just not the best fit for it. That's a really good point. Like there are definitely deals where I know I'm coming in um, fighting an uphill battle. And when you have a full pipeline, you definitely want to focus on the prospective clients that you can help the most, right? And you don't want to die on hills that you can't climb. So um, being able to recognize and understand that and know that there are situations where your prospective clients are going to see more value in your competitors. And if you can't change their minds and they truly are a better fit for them, being able to understand that and prioritize your time effectively is really important. 
Did you catch Q humble bragging about his full pipeline there? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but now you mention it. Um, all right. Well, we, we're going to get into sort of the product marketing and seller partnership soon, but I, I want to kind of pull on this thread a little bit more of just competitive selling with, with Q in the room here. You mentioned earlier the, the concept of a value wedge. Um, so can you, can you explain that a little bit and how you use it in the context of a competitive deal? Yeah, the value wedge has been my saving grace, to be honest. If there's anything that's helped me win any deals against competitors, it's been the value wedge. And this is something that my sales director taught me earlier this year. And it's kind of like thinking of a, a Venn diagram where on one side, you have all the things that are unique to your product. And again, to Mitch's point, you need to understand what's unique to your competitor's product to have a good understanding of what's unique to you. And the other side is what's important to your prospect. And only certain things that are unique to you are going to be important to your prospect. And that's where those things converge. And this is why I like to have seven to 10 unique differentiators at a high level that I can pick and pluck from based on what's important to my prospect to create this value wedge. And I ideally want two to three value wedge points. You don't want to have too many. You don't want to have too little, but two to three value wedge points that are really important to your prospect that you, again, just drive home in every single conversation, literally. And every time a prospect asks you a question, you drive it back to those value edges because those are the things that are important to them. Those are going to resonate. And it's really hard for prospects to remember things a salesperson says to you. Like you, you, you likely won't, but you'll definitely remember things that you say to them, right? So being able to tie everything back to something that they said is important to them is going to get them to engage more. It's going to get them to talk more. And ultimately it's going to get them to remember those value edges more. And it just makes it a lot easier to sell that way. And it's harder for them to grip onto the things your competitors are saying, if they're focused on feature level, you know, like things that are not necessarily important to your prospect, you're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall there. That's, that's such an interesting point in terms of their, I, it kind of speaks to your point again about letting the letting the prospect, letting the buyer speak because they're going to know exactly what they said far more than what the 20% that they're actually going to retain from the other person in the conversation. Mitch, from your perspective over at Lead IQ, I'm sure you've got a couple killer competitive sellers as well. What, what, are, what have you seen that makes them successful? Yeah. Um... I really think when it comes to competitive selling, it's that collaboration piece of not just working with your, your product marketing person or your competitive in, Intel person, but working together with other sellers. Um, I mean, everyone has the things that work and the more you can share that back is really what starts to separate and, and kind of grow it as a team. Um, but I think the ones who the competitor, competitive sellers who are the best are the ones who aren't afraid to tackle it head on. Um, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't be afraid to talk about your competitors. Cause if you have that information, you should kind of get out in front of it. Cause otherwise you're allowing your competitors to set the, uh, the narrative around what's going on. And I mean, we've seen that at lead IQ where competitors have gotten in earlier than us. And we hear stuff from the prospect that we're like, okay, that's coming directly from that competitor. Like we know mm -hmm. it because we see it on their website. We see it in their content. Like, so being uh, early with that and kind of taking that head on, I think is really what separates the really good ones from, from everyone else. And also like people buy from people, people don't buy products, right? So when you come in with confidence and you truly believe that you can solve their problems better than the alternative solutions, that will resonate. Like your, your buyers will smell that they can feel that and that will make them trust you more in the end. Right. So um, I think it's so, so important to do that. Oh, Katie's got a good question here that I would love to ask. Katie, you want to jump on camera and ask this one? Or do you want me to ask on your behalf here? Oh my God, I can say it myself. I'll read my question. Uh, this is for Q. So my question is, uh, when you know that a competitor is in the deal before you, so like, you know, that prospects already seen the competitors sort of platform before hours, um, how does that impact your strategy going into demo or first call with prospect? Yeah, I, um, I really like that actually, to be honest, you can think of competitors as like a glass half empty situation or a glass half full situation. And you can't avoid them. They're going to be in every deal. And if you think about them in a positive way, they can really accelerate your deals. 
So I kind of get excited when I know that there's a competitor in the deal because I know my prospect is taking things seriously. And it also gives me the ability to, like, I feel like I have a leg up almost when a competitor is in a deal first because I can focus my discovery on like what they care about, what they liked about the competitive offering, what they didn't like about the competitive offering. And that gives me so much more ammo to sell, right? So um, <clears throat> definitely focusing my discovery more so on like, what they find valuable in a CI platform, what value they see in a CI platform in general, and trying to relate that to like the things that my competitors does really, really strong. Um, also, sometimes if I know that there's a competitor in the deal before I've met with them, I might email their team and share with them some things that I think are important for them to keep in mind or just get ahead of stuff, get them thinking about things. Um, anything I can do to, to shine the light on us and move it away from the competition is is what I'm trying to do, and and the earlier I have that information, the the better I can figure out ways to, um, to combat competitors and deals. Can I ask Thank a follow up on that, Adam? So, sure, Q, okay. you said you sometimes would send an email before that meeting. What, what's in this email? Yeah, I'll give you a real example, actually. So I was working with a with a client recently, and this this was this is a tough one. So the prospective client was coming from a company that used a competitor of ours. And now he was evaluating at his new company and I knew he saw success with it. I knew I was going to be fighting an uphill battle. And I, and it was a bit of a weird situation because they hadn't seen the competitor yet, but he had already been using it for two years. So what I did was I had our SDR actually email their team because I hadn't met their team yet. This is after the SDR ran the intro call and um, sent a bunch of questions that they should ask our competitor um, that would trip them up. And uh, I'm not sure how that landed. I have really no idea, but those are just some, those little strategies that I'll use to kind of get ahead of competitors, right? Um, so, yeah. Katie, thank you for the question. We have another question too. So we, I know she'll have a, a bunch of questions to ask. Those were two really good ones. All right, we've got, this is actually, we've got Ben who's willing to come on cam here to drop a question. And this is actually something that, we chatted about off air as well in terms of identifying competitors. So Ben, do you want to jump on and ask a question as well? Sure. Appreciate it. Uh, good conversation, gents. Um, so uh, my question is, and we kind of struggle with this, um, I think in our organization so far, and just kind of curious, it's kind of a follow-up to a discussion that you all were having before, but um, you know, how do you, how do you identify a competitor when you're in a competitive situation um or is there something on a a battle card or a slide deck that that helps you identify like using keywords or key themes that you can quickly look to to, to really help yourself identify those competitors in those situations uh, i'd love to hear mitch's take on this but i'd be curious to know from you ben it depends on the situation like some of the industries that we work with folks are really hesitant to share who else they're evaluating, right? So in those situations, like when you ask them, who else are you evaluating? You know, they're not going to tell you or they're just not going to tell you. So in those situations, 100%, I lean on like keywords or key themes that I know our competitors are consistently saying in their messaging. And you can tease that out from their marketing materials. You can tease that out really easily from listening to sales conversations if you have some recorded calls. But um, key verbiage, key terms, key themes, um, that you can um, leverage to help tease out whether there's a competitor in a deal is something that I, I definitely lean on. But Mitch, I'd be super curious to hear your take on that. Yeah, I think um, if you've got a pretty good idea of what your competitor's sort of value prop is, um, when you start hearing questions from the prospects, I think you can start to put together. And I think like you said, if you have past deals where you know a competitor had popped up, you can go back and if you've got those sales calls or talking to the reps, like start to dig into some of the things they heard and you might start to notice those patterns and then you can sort of train the reps on that to listen for it. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of depends. Like in, in lead IQs industry, everyone's pretty straight up forward with us and says, Hey, we're looking at these guys. Um, but yeah, I know some industries are a little bit, a little bit tougher to get there. So I would say, yeah, the, the historical record talking to the reps on uh, times that these guys popped up um, really do some of that digging to notice trends. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think that it's more of a, it's more of a training opportunity and training the sales reps as opposed to, to having just something 
there for them to look at while they're on the, the call or something? I think so for sure. And I think um, for sellers who are going to competitive conversations, a lot of the times they're just scared to ask if there's competitors in deals, right? And if they do ask and the prospect tells them no, then they're scared again and they don't want to follow up on that. But there are situations where I'll ask my prospective client, are you evaluating any other tools? And they'll come back kind of brash and say, hey, like, you know, let's not focus on that. I'm focused on your solution at the moment. Sometimes just providing some justification on why you're asking them that question is all they need to open up and tell you who they're competing or who you're competing with, right? So sometimes saying, hey, look, I totally get it. I'm not trying to come in here and bash who else you might be evaluating, but I think it's going to be really helpful for you to understand where we differ from these other tools that you're evaluating. It's going to make it a lot easier for you to make a decision on which tool is the best fit for your business. Mm -hmm. And just that sometimes gets your prospective client to understand that you're not like this aggressive salesperson that's trying to come in there and sell the crap out of them. It's really just trying to understand their business and show them where they might see value in your tool or the other things that they're evaluating. So hundred percent training your sellers, taking away that fear. And then part of that too, is if they don't have content to reference, they're not going to be confident and they're always going to have fear and they're not going to want to ask questions about competitors. So if they have some consistent, solid talk tracks that they can always go back to and lean on that work, um, that will give them the confidence and help mitigate the fear of asking who competitors are and help them dig into a little bit more, ask for the just or provide the justification, stuff like that. Yeah, Q, I mean, I think I think you hit on, I mean, you want to be seen as kind of that partner and not, I think sometimes prospects get worried you're just going to start bashing the competitor or going on the rant about all the things that are different about you. But at the end of the day, it's, you want to be kind of that consultant to them. And I think it's training the sales team to, yeah, talk about that and explain why you're trying to figure out who else is in that. So you can make sure they get the right solution or right product. Ben, that was a great question. I appreciate it. And it's, Kelly, in the chat, you, you are, as Q was answering, it was almost like a, an echo. You were both saying the same thing at the same point. So I, I love that. And Q, is that sort of where like those value edges come into play that you mentioned before when you were saying, kind of doing that like digging on figuring out if there's a comparison, like justifying why do you bring the value edges into play there? Or is that? Um, I bring value wedges into play just kind of throughout my conversations. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't, I won't even, I won't even talk about value wedges until I have a really good understanding of like what they're, what's important to them or what they care about. So that's why, again, it's so important to help just identify if there's a competitor in the deal. And also if they're open to talking about it, if you have a prospective client that's going to tell you what other competitors are in the deal, don't stop there. Like dig in more. What do you like about what did you like about that solution? What, what appealed to you about that? What were you hoping for from that solution that you didn't necessarily see out of that? That arms me so much when I'm talking to prospective clients because that in itself tells me what's important to them. And it also tells me what they liked about competitors all in the same question, right? So um, if, if you have a prospect that's open, dig into it as much as possible in a respectful way, still focused on with the context of like, I'm only trying to understand this so I can help consult you on what might be the best fit. I'm not trying to understand this so I can bash my competitors. I'm not asking you a bunch of questions and focusing the whole conversation on our competitors. I'm asking you these questions because I'm trying to understand what's important to you so that I can share with you what might be valuable to you in our solution. All right, we, we're, we're going to get into sort of the PMM and seller partnership. But before we do so, I had two questions. They're kind of, they're both on sort of competitive research. And I want to I wanna get them asked before we go into sort of the, the, the partnership side of thing. Uh, Alex Benjamin had a question around kind of the unethical and ethical areas of research. And I'd love to get your take on this one, Mitch. Um, Alex, are you keen yeah. to jump on here? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yep. Thanks for having me on. And uh, this is fantastic. Really enjoying the session. Just a quick one on competitive analysis. I've, I've um, had three startups I've built. And in the startup stage, it's very easy to get out there and be cavalier about um, questions I ask, being a customer, applying, going through the process. Obviously, when your business gets going, you've got an email, a LinkedIn profile. It's much easier to see you're a real competitor. And I, I've always just felt like the ethics change or at least like how hard I go on my competitive research changes during the maturity, you know, the growth of my companies. 
And um, I'm just interested to how you think about ethics at Clue and how, how far is too far when going about getting competitive research or analysis? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one of the things that we try to stay away from is secret shopping. Um, we try to focus on things that we can find that are publicly available and things that we're hearing directly from prospective clients. And especially when you're in like an earlier stage startup and you're competing with other companies that are like small mom and pop shops who are also just getting their business started and don't have a lot of online presence, your best way to get information on those companies is to lean on your sales team and to train them to ask the right questions, to dig in, to help them understand what your competitors do, what value they provide, what their features do. Have open conversations with prospective clients about that stuff. Um, and also, um, if you're in a space where you can get your hands on like freemium products and stuff like that, being able to get in there, of course, is really, really helpful. But from an ethics perspective, I think we just try to stay as far away from secret shopping as possible um, just to maintain a level of professionalism and, and focus on the things that are available to us and things that we can leverage in a, in a, in a safe manner, I would say. Do you think that that is, though, where the, the crux of the differentiation is, is the onboarding process? Like, so if you knew exactly how a, custom, a competitor uh, makes it frictionless to get through to a conversion, is that not really helpful for you to be able to talk to it's it's definitely helpful like I, I mean having access to our competitors demos and products and understanding exactly how those things work are helpful of course but not necessarily available to the broad spectrum of folks and i think having to go through some back channel ways to get information from from your competitors where they don't necessarily know that they're sharing this stuff with you i don't think is necessarily the most professional way to get your hands on information whereas you're also in a safe place when you're finding things that are publicly available or hearing things directly from prospective clients, right? Um, and from like a legal perspective um, as well, I think there's implications there. So again, just trying to focus on things that are safe and, and accessible to us. And, and um, again, I think everything fo being focused around your buyers, I think is the most important thing. Like, like there's so many things that your competitors can do that you can like if I watch a demo of one of my competitor's products, I'll see a whole bunch of features and things um, that I think are cool, but what, what, what ones of those actually matter to the prospect, right? Which ones of those do buyers actually resonate with and care about? So that's why I think hearing the differentiators from the prospective client is like a double-edged sword because it not only tells you what your competitors can do and how they operate, but it also tells you how they resonate with it and what's important to them. And then you can use that to better differentiate and craft, craft messaging and um, and build your competitive program. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but hopefully um, that is. <laughs> I think it's helpful. It's it's good understanding at least. It, it can be great at times, and um, it's good hearing that that's your approach and style. So, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, think the, sorry, the demos on. too. Like it, when product marketing, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later. But you always want to give context to it. So just giving a demo to a sales rep to say, hey, here's what the competitor looks like. Again, you're gonna they're gonna see a lot of features and stuff. So that's where kind of as a product marketing person, you want to be able to give, hey, this is the demo, but here are the takeaways from it. Like it's this is what their value prop is, like this is how we should position against it. Um, because otherwise it just becomes noise and then we get back into that features conversation, right? Right. One that's thing a great... that I could add there that that I've seen in the past that's worked well is. Um, when you have prospective clients that are really open and you develop a really, really solid relationship with them and they're already using competitors, they might just screen share and show you the product. And I feel like that's totally okay because they're doing that at their own will. You're not prompting them to do it. And then again, it's that double-edged sword of them showing you the features that are unique to that product that also resonate with them. And that's what you can take away and use from that. So that's another cool way to get your hands on like more direct um, product understanding, but that comes back to having a really strong relationship with your prospects so that they trust you and are open to sharing those things with you. Again, with the context of you being able to advise them. Mm. Especially customers that aren't happy with that competitor. And then you start to get into like, it's like a, a live G2 review where you get to kind of hear like, Hey, this is, this isn't what's working for us with them. And this is why you guys are better. Like yeah, and that's mm -hmm. working with your, your CSM team, your AMs to sort of identify who those uh, might be, or if they're just recording the calls, they can see that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Alex, great question. That one, that one went down a different tangent. I really, I love 
Love that conversation. Um, I appreciate it. And Alex, we've got our own, I believe Brandon, our own competitive enablement manager who does a lot of our, conducts a lot of our research as well as on this, on this uh, meeting right now too. So I'll make sure for him to kind of connect with you too and kind of talk about the ins and outs on that research inside of things too. Appreciate it. No worries. All right, let's get into, we've got a little bit of time left because I know Q's probably got another 17 demos scheduled after this meeting. Um, well, let's get into the like, product marketing and seller partnership because across a, like, a common trend I've seen amongst a ton of product marketers I've spoken to on the podcast and, all on, and anyone running kind of competitive enablement is the ones that are enjoying the most success have this really tight relationship and this clear visibility with sales. Uh, I got a couple of questions before and Jenny, she just dropped me a note. Unfortunately, she couldn't make this session, but she wanted to ask this question to you, Mitch, is what are the most valuable things you've done to build uh, an internal competitive brand within the company? Jenny actually made it. Did she? Oh yeah, there she is. Yeah. I Jenny. joined Hi. <laughs> Jenny. I appreciate you joining me. I'll let you ask your follow-up question too after this one. I know you've got yeah. one on newsletters and that everyone wants to know about newsletters. So I'll let you, I'll let you ask the, the next one. Sorry for stealing your no, time. No, all good. Um, thanks so much for bringing my question in the loop. I unfortunately just got dropped from our SKO outline because competitive is new. My role just started four months ago. They're worried about, do we have enough content? It's not that important. I'm sure y'all have heard similar queries before, but now it's kind of my goal of figuring out how do I build that internal brand beyond just the one-on-one -on -one building relationships, you know, spamming all the channels you can without being annoying and kind of just being, becoming best friends with sales managers and telling them, hey, this works, you know, like there's research and content out there. If you want me to join a team meeting, I can. Um, I feel like there's a much elegant way to go about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So when I started at Lead IQ like eight months ago, I was building the competitive program basically, basically from scratch. We had some stuff, but I really believe in sort of like the grassroots approach to it, where um, I think the biggest thing for product marketing is to be visible to them. So you don't necessarily want to spam all the channels, but um, one of the things we've done is like the competitive newsletter, which goes out to both the sellers and leadership. Um, I think the other thing potentially you could do is looking at um, if, if they're if they don't think competitive is that big of a deal, looking into your CRM to find out how many deals do we have that are competitive, how many are we winning, how many are we losing, and then if you're losing a lot, you can show that data to them to say, hey this is kind of a big deal because we're losing to these two competitors all the time. Um, but I really took kind of a grassroots approach and it's taken six or seven months here, but I'm at to the point now where individual reps are coming to me to ask me to jump on a customer call or um, for specific things about a specific competitor, but it's really just trying to be visible. So if being doing trainings, we've done like uh, specific trainings for new competitors um, with the sales team, um, the competitive newsletter is a great way to just get it out there. And again, giving context to what's going on um, and not just the news, but why is the news matter? Why is it important for you guys? Um, and I think just taking it, you sounds like you're in kind of a tough spot with the leadership, maybe not seeing it, but starting to screenshot when you do get a success story mm -hmm. with a rep um, and being able to kind of compile all that into something that uh, hopefully will hopefully will grow for you there. Yeah. One of one of those points, I think, and I'd love to get Q's perspective on this. When Mitch said like the grassroots perspective as well, like kind of getting a grassroots support for it too, is being able to provide early wins and early value, especially to your sales force. And then, like Mitch said, um, kind of showcasing those early wins and uh, early successes to leadership to kind of prove like a proof of concept kind of thing. Q, what what's your perspective as a seller there? One thing that I think just talking about like building a brand and what's really helped me buy into the brand of competitive enablement at Clue in our own CI program is when Brandon picked up doing our newsletter, he was consistent with it. It came out every Thursday. So it comes out every Thursday. It comes out in the same channel. It comes out in Slack. It comes out through email and it always contains relevant information. And what I find most helpful and I think why Brandon's newsletter is so successful is it's a combination of five to eight items. 
And the most helpful things are recent wins and losses. Because if I'm a seller and I'm going into a deal against a competitor, I absolutely want to know why my colleague lost a deal to that competitor last week. So I don't run into those same roadblocks or I'm going to lose that deal too, or there's a way higher chance. So recent wins and losses and the reasons why um, recent news is helpful. And then shouting out your sellers for sharing information. And that third point is really important because once you start sharing a newsletter out in Slack, for example, and you start to send it out every Thursday, for example, your sellers will start to trust that you're on top of the competition. They're going to start engaging with that newsletter. You're going to get a bunch of emojis. Folks will hopefully start to comment on it and you can use that to drive conversation. And that will naturally drive more engagement. And um, personally, for me as a sales rep, who has bought into this brand of competitive enablement at Clue, that newsletter and how it was shared and the content within it is 100% one of the reasons that I'm bought into it. And one other piece too is if you guys use like a gong or a chorus or any call recording tool, sharing snippets of effective depositioning or effective objection handling is just, it's like, it's like next level. The, the, um, the level of information mm-hmm. and value I get from listening to a colleague handle an objection or deposition a competitor is not even comparable to reading bullet points. So these are things you can use to get your sales team engaged. And I think just the consistency, um, showing them that you're on top of that stuff will help build confidence in it. And then you can use that to drive engagement on it. And then that will help you get executive attention on it as well. Love that. And actually, that was my follow up question, Adam, that you were trying to plug for me was what sections. um, So all four sections are actually in my newsletter, but I'm very curious to hear the rest of the team on this call. What sections do you put in your newsletter? Even for the reps, what do you find helpful Mm -hmm. and all that? Yeah, so we uh, kind of like he was saying, so we do um, recent news. Um, ours is monthly right now. And then we do kind of a weekly, like quick snippet of a couple of things. But in my monthly one, um, recent wins, and I'll interview or talk to one of our sales reps who had that big win. And we'll kind of highlight what the deal was. How did we win it? How did we deposition stuff like that? Um, the other thing that I that I think is really effective in there is if you have a Slack channel or something for competitors, that can get really noisy really quickly. So I actually go through over the last month and pull out all the important shares and give shout outs to the sellers or, or product or whoever it is that's um, shared that and really just highlight and say like, hey, thanks. Like this was a great share by this person or um And I think it does two things, both a, you're kind of highlighting the people who are doing that, um, which is always nice. We like to be highlighted, but it also helps them kind of, oh, I missed that in Slack that day. Let me go back and click on it. Um, For ours, those Slack links back to the old conversations are the most clicked thing that happens in our newsletter because again, there's so much, there's so many different channels. Um, It's a great way to sort of summarize all that. Good points. Thank you. I'm so I'm so glad you managed to make it. Um, also, I wanted to add on that point about the kind of the internal branding part. The the previous question too. One thing that uh, in ter- like providing value can kind of be a buzzword, and I feel like I said it like providing value to the sellers. One thing that Brandon on our own team has done is th- this seller confidence survey, and so he's pulled all the sellers to say, okay, who are you confident again? What competitors are you struggling with? Where are you struggling? And by doing that, he's now using their words. He's can aggregate and be like, okay, I'm see that you're struggling against competitor X. So that's where my initial efforts are going to go because that's low hanging fruit. You know, that that's going to generate a response. If you're able to support sellers against this competitor or this um, landmine that's tripping them up and it allows you to have early direction, I think as well. And yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Brandon on our own team. And I think that's another great opportunity to, get that internal brand from the grassroots perspective. Yeah, I think I saw his his post on that too. And, and he had a really good take that a lot of times it's not the competitor you think mm. is going to come up is the one that they need the most help with. Because your, your top competitor, they've probably ran into so many times now that they feel pretty confident with it. But it's probably that mid-level who's maybe coming up a lot more now or they don't see quite as often, but they just don't quite know how to talk to it. And it's a great way to find that out. A hundred percent. And I can attest to that. Like our top competitor, I don't need a lot of information on. Um, But some of those mid-tier competitors are ones that don't come up as often that I'm not as polished on is are the ones that I need information on the most. So 
running a sales confidence survey is going to shine so much light on what um, your sales team perceives as the biggest threats to the pipeline. And also validating that with Salesforce data or CRM data is really helpful too, because seller, sellers can get really subjective and get caught up in the moment with competitors that aren't necessarily threats to your pipeline. So when you can put those things side by side and see like, okay, here are the competitors that are actually winning deals and taking revenue from us and couple that with here, are the competitors that our sales team is asking for information on that overlap will help you prioritize your landscape and, and really help you drive um, your strategy forward. Totally. I've got another question here. This is sort of, yeah, on this kind of product marketing selling partnership, it is, oh, we got a lot of questions going on here. This one was from, I believe it's from Anna. Anna, you were talking about sort of your selling, your sellers are really kind of stuck in the feature and pricing battle. Uh, and you want to know how you can kind of elevate or change the mindset. So do you, are you comfortable coming on and asking that question, even though I just sort of paraphrased it my bad uh anna had to jump at him so uh anna had so. such a well, good thing i completely just take took her question from her um yeah it's the it's the idea of she said my sales organizations focused on that features and pricing uh because they're in the industrial manufacturing uh industry do you have any tips or examples on what you've done to slowly change that mindset or help sales enablement focus more on the value prop side of things yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I think there's potential there. You can kind of do uh, a test with a small group. So as as you're kind of working with the sales team, if you've got a big sales org, you're not going to be able to build those tight relationships with everyone. But it's finding who those kind of champions are who are going to really um, work with you, provide you feedback, and stuff like that. And I think you can almost A B test it with them and say, hey. I want you on the next couple pitches, like let's try this talk track or um, focusing more on this value prop, use this deck, something that changes it up. And then you can, again, if you have a call recording, you can kind of see how that, how that plays with that. But yeah, I'd love uh, Q's take on that too. Yeah. And this is how I kind of approach when I'm getting kind of back into a corner about a specific feature or about pricing. So when I get back into a corner about a feature and it's very natural as a salesperson to want to respond right? And respond with like why your feature is better or, you know, why they should focus on your feature over theirs. I think in those situations, training your sales enablement team or getting them to train your sellers to ask questions. Don't be so um, trigger happy to respond, but rather ask like, why are you asking about this feature? Like what's important about this feature to you? And that allows you to bring the conversation back to a value level because now you're teasing out of them what value they see from the feature. And now you're not caught up in a feature level conversation. So just having a question there that allows your prospect to move away from what they're focused on as a feature um, will allow you to bring that conversation up to a higher level and then drive it forward from there. The other thing that works really well for me from a pricing perspective, and I do this in all my deals, is when I have a, a prospect that's evaluating multiple competitors and pricing is coming up in the conversation, I always say, look, we are going to find alignment on pricing when we get, when we're ready for those conversations, I'm going to bring my executive into the conversation and we'll work something out but I want you to focus on finding the best partner for your, um, for your team. And that itself just gives them the reassurance that like there will be a conversation around pricing. There is some room for like negotiation and allows me to simply just brush this off until they've told me that I'm vendor of choice. Now they've lost a lot of their negotiating power because now there's no other competitors in the deal. And now they still have that reassurance that we're going to work something out. So they feel confident telling you that I'm vendor of choice and all that kind of stuff. So just brushing off pricing and bringing a feature level question to a value focused um, stage, just by asking a question of why that's important to them, I think are really good ways to move away from those lower level conversations that we often get back into a corner for. Uh, Mark, Mark wanted to chime in on this, on this topic as well. So Mark, do you want to, do you want to hop on and, and share your thoughts as well? Surely. Yes. Um, I trust that the people can hear. Um, Anna's question, um, which is probably quite relevant because this is what we do, my, my, my own company. Um, it, it seems that Anna and Anna's team are in dialogue with a particular client or clients and the impression I got from the from the text is that they have ongoing business relationship with these people but the people are conducting the business relationship based on 
parameters of their choice and Anna is struggling to move them at least somewhat in the direction of discussing the parameters of her choice. Well, that, of course, um, there might be other answers to this, but that depends on, to some degree, on how you present your proposals. You must make sure that your proposals um, contain the information and the, the angles and the parameters and the criteria um, that you want to be the basis of the conversations so that over a period of time and a number of proposals, um, the client, they won't have the conversation on your terms. Clients don't do that, but they may move more towards you. End of contribution. <laughs> Mic drop. I love it. And Mark, I, I appreciate you jumping in on that. That was a great addition. Um, we're coming, we're actually coming up on time. Wow, that really went by quickly. Hey, uh, there's, there's going to be a couple questions, unfortunately, that get left unanswered. But what we'll do is Ben and I will peruse through and see any questions that didn't get answered and we'll get them answered for you. We'll get Q, we'll get Mitch back in for either a podcast episode, maybe some, there's, I think there's a lot more threads we can pull on here. So if you have any follow-up questions too from all of this, we've touched a ton of different topics, drop them to me. Uh, you can hit me up at adam.mcqueen at clue.com. Drop them to Q, Mitch, um, hit them up on LinkedIn, all of that. And yeah, let's keep this conversation going. Q, Mitch, I appreciate your time so much. This was, this was awesome. Yeah, no, and I appreciate everybody who, who made the call here. There's so many great questions and the conversation was really, really fun. So uh, thank you all for joining. And like Adam said, if you have any questions, I'd love to connect with you all. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, drop me a note, provide me some feedback. Um, we'd love to hear it all. Yeah, same guys. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And yeah, love to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, let's do it again sometime. We'll catch you all next time.